Hey everyone, I hope your day was good because now it's time for the second online edition of HackConf Talks. <clears throat> I'm happy to see so many people here. For now only 20, but I hope more will come. So first I want to thank you to our partners Launchy. Thanks to them, we are broadcasting uh, here on the platform Hopping, where later you can ask your questions directly to Rado. Today, our guest is Rado Stankov. Probably most of you know him. He is a web developer with, with 15 plus years of experience, and he is the head of engineering at Product Hunt. Also, Rado, is organizer of the React Sofia Meetup and uh, the conference React Not a Conf. Today, Radu will share with us his experience with the developing desktop apps with uh, React and Electron. This sounds really interesting, so prepare yourself with a notebook or something else where you can write down all the useful tips. Now we are going to hear from him. Now, Radu, the online stage is yours. Thank you, Tony. Okay, guys. Hello, everybody. Do, uh, I guess my, my screen is visible. So let's get started for today. Uh, is, my, is my screen visible? Okay. Uh, so today we're going to talk about developing desktop apps with React and Electron. Uh, like Tony mentioned, I'm Rado Stankov. Uh, this is all my online addresses. You can basically find me there everywhere. I work for a company called Product Hunt. And all my slides, all the slides I'm going to show you today are already on this address. So you, if you couldn't follow along or you find something interesting, it's here. Uh, the code which I'm going to show you today is from an open source app which I developed the last couple of months. So the code uh, I'm going to show here is also at this address, so you can just check check it out. So before I start, I would give you a bit of like context about Electron, because in general, in order to, um, we need to, uh, in order to understand something, we have to have some context. You have to understand where it came from. Like I can imagine that most of you knows like a, know a small website called GitHub, who was sold for like seven billion dollars, uh, and, uh, and this website started like quite a long time ago, and at some point they released something called Atom, uh, which is like a text editor, which I can imagine a lot of you of you guys use now, like most probably the VS Code is like the new range, but Atom was the one which was kind of before it. And from Atom, they actually extracted a framework which is called Electron, which they used to build Atom, to make Atom a cross-platform application so they can actually write the Atom text editor to be, um, to be usable from other environments. To, so it can be used on Mac, it can be used on Linux, it can be used on Windows uh, with just a single code base. And that was like their uh, goal. Also, Electron, uh, when open sourced, it was actually picked up by quite a bit of other companies. Like I think the two of the most prevalent applications for Electron is the first one is Slack. Uh, which is like a chat client, which a lot of people use, especially in the situations right now, which is uh, which uses Electron. And the other one is Visual Studio Code, which is basically the new editor, which is all the rage. <laughs> the funny thing here is that uh, VS Code is, uh, is an editor, which is like um, competitor to Atom, which was made from GitHub. And right now, Microsoft owns GitHub, and they both own Atom and VS Code, and they own Electron, which also builds on top of it. So it's like it's a, so life is funny in that way. Of course, Electron is actually used for a lot, a lot of a lot of other apps. Like if you go to the Electron website and you just click on the Apps tab, 
you can actually see a lot of applications being there. Uh, for, uh, and a lot of, of ones which are actually, you might actually use every day and not even realize that they are electron. So, <coughs> so what exactly is electron? Like uh, what, what electron does is it allows us to use the uh, web technologies to build desktop applications. It basically uses uh, Chromium as a rendering uh, for rendering your screen. And in this way, you can use the technologies which most web developers know, which is HTML and JavaScript to, and CSS, of course, uh, to build the, 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 the UI of the application. Uh, the reason why they go that way is because, to be honest, when GitHub started it, they were mostly web developers. Like, that's the technologies they knew. So they actually built like that. Let me for a bit. So uh, that's basically elect Electron is just a glorified Chrome window. But it's not only that. So... Electron actually is um, uh, support something which uh, the browser support in the background, and that's multi-threading. Like when you write an Electron app, in the worst case, you have two processes. One is called the main process, which is like a Node.js process, and this is the process which is called, uh, which is used to talk to the operating system. That's the, the process where you have access to the bare metal of the system basically they they wrote a javascript apis which wrap a lot of native apis and later in the talk i'm going to show you some of the uses of those apis and the other thing they use is a chrome window where you can actually render your ui and there is so and the nice thing about that is you can actually have a, a one main process and have multiple render process Basically, you get, get a renderer process per window, like if your application is a multi-window application. Uh, the, the renderer and the main process um, you, uh, talk with each other via an RPC channel. So the renderer channel can send and call methods from the main, from the main process and vice versa. So in this way, you can actually, from your web browser, you can actually access the desktop and everything around it. And this is, for example, uh, in, in during the talk, if you notice that here in the top corner, when you see the Chrome logo, that means that the code I'm showing you is code which usually lives in the um, process of the browser, of the, of the renderer process. And this is a, a way for this renderer process, for example, to close the window like you basically call window require and require the electron package and electron package you can say electron get me the current window and close it and this function would actually close your window and depending how your application is set up it might if this is like your only window it can actually turn off the whole application if your application supports multiple windows it might just close one of the windows but uh, for the terms of like, okay, a single render window, it, it cares that it's just closed. Uh, the other way you can communicate is you have this IPC renderer channel where you can send events from the renderer process to the main process. And this is the, the way for you to, to, to directly communicate between the two processes by, by sending messages between them. Uh, like in this case, I'm sending an event with two arguments. And in the main process, like notice in the corner, this console icon, in the main process, you can actually receive this event and handle it in a way. Like later in the talk, I'm actually going to show how this is used for, to communicate and deal with anything around that whole thing. And that's basically it. Like that's basically the hybrid overview of what Electron is. It's basically a way for us to have our own mini browser without the browser Chrome, giving us the ability to uh, 
build desktop applications. And what, what I want to show you today, like I was thinking for this lecture, like I can give you all the, like the basics examples and basically I can tell you, oh, ah, here it is like a very simple cases. This is how you show text and all of that. But this is, so there is a lot of content on the internet where you can actually see that. Like uh, you can basically go to YouTube and see like a video of like a basic tutorial. What I want to show you now is actually how a real application which I developed the, during the last couple of months is built some of the nifty greedy things uh, in its architecture. Some of the solutions, I, it took me quite a bit Googling and tinkering to find. And I wanted to share this with you in this call. So the application I'm going to, to share with you guys is uh, an, a, a mini app I developed just in order to learn Erectron because I wanted to see how the platform worked and I wanted to learn it by, by making something really simple. So uh, in my day to day, I use this app called Bear, which is like my favorite not note taking app. Basically, all my life is taught in this app Bear. And I noticed that what I have this habit of uh, when I work on some task, I usually have a template in Bear, which is like a note, which always have the same structure. I have a task for the day. I have a group of bookmarks, uh, which are like things which my task is related. It might be links to tickets. It might be links to uh, some documentation. It might be links to designs. And I have like a random area with notes where sometimes I sketch some ideas. So, so, but that's like, Bear is great as a note-taking app, but it's not very good as a to-do app. So during the last couple of months, you can imagine, like I can imagine like, like most of you, I had a lot of time spending at home, like a lot of time just sitting at home, not having anything to do. So I decided, okay, why don't I just spend that time instead of just watching Netflix or HBO? <laughs> Should I just sit and make something useful? And what I started doing was a lot of minor things I do. I actually made small apps for me to help me just make me a bit more productive, feel me, make me feel better. So I spent a lot of that time like actually coding and playing with a lot of things. And one of the first things I made for myself is this thing, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, this talk is uh, this app called Focus Task. That's how I named it. That's what its logo is. So it's a basically a menu bar app. Actually, I'm going to show you the app now. So this is basically the app. It's like a it's like a Mac OS because I don't have Windows or Linux machines, so I just know it works on Mac. So it's like a Mac menu bar app for like basically converting this bare note file for myself. So it has like three sections. One of them is like to do tasks, the to do I, I can have to do's. I can I have those to do. Uh, I can nest them like I can have nested to do's. I can rearrange them. I have these bookmarks, which is very useful for me because, for example, I can actually link files. Like I can just get a file from here, another link. And then if I click Command 3, you see this file now is opened. Uh, the same is for the bookmarks. If I click Command 2, 3, I have like my sketch note uh, thingy. Uh, the app is very shortcut focused. Like I spend, a, oops, that's the change log. It's very focused on shortcuts. Like it's very focused for me to have like really quick access. Like if I click command slash, I, it opens the app. I can do a lot of quick things with the app. So my goal basically with the app was to actually don't uh, have something really quick when I'm like coding, doing some work here and there. Like I just click the shortcut, I have any of uh, I, for a note, write a note, then I'm click. I click, I, I have an idea for what to do, uh, for a task. I just click it here or I have to bookmark a file. Like I open this, open the bookmark and it's like a very simple app, but 
even that simple app, which the core of the app was kind of ready for like two days, uh, it needed a lot of like smaller polishing to make it like useful as a desktop app. So the app itself uh, has a lot of like cool technologies, uh, like it has React, Redux, TypeScript, Lodash, CSS modules, Prettier, of course, but that's the new thing. Like I have used all the other stuff. It's it wasn't uh, uh, the, the funny thing for me for this app in particular was Electron and and how you can actually make it work with Electron. How you can package a real application with it. What's actually needed? Because like reading tutorials, everybody, everybody just tells you the basic steps. The basic steps are yeah, you create this hello world, you have this text and you are done. But how do you solve a lot of problems where you actually have real problems and you need to solve those? So I'm going to take cover some of those tasks which I found them interested thing to show you and hopefully it can be helpful for you guys. So the first thing is uh, this app is written in React and um, and in order to read it for React, React has a lot of machinery. It has a lot of stuff. So I, in the background, I use React Create App. In integrating React Create App together with Electron is not that easy. So this is the directory structure of the application. And if you notice here, I actually have three package JSON files and I have, and it's like, three package JSON files. Why I don't just have like a one, like I split application in parts, but this, and I have like those three JSON. And, uh, and I was showing this to a friend and it's like the first thing they asked me, like, why, why do you have, why you don't just have like a single uh, file where you have all that uh, package JSON? The reason for this is Traditionally, most apps, yeah, yeah, you would need just like a one package JSON. But in my case, I actually have three separate places where they have different code, they have different purposes, and they are distributed in a different way. Like the main app, the app, which is in app package, that's the, the, the Chrome of the app. That's if you, oops, sorry. If you click here, that's the UI here. Like, uh, because this is Electron, I can actually start the Chrome inspector and I can actually inspect stuff here. And that's like basically the React Create app. Like for example, the way I connected it, this with React Create app is actually if I go to localhost 3000, you notice it's the same UI. And this is one of the tricks I'll show you in a bit how you can use React Create app for L Electron. The second part is the shell. That's the thing which talks with the operation system. That's the thing which deals with a lot of stuff which is around that. And uh, some of that is because I have this particular app which is like a menu bar app. And the menu bar apps in Mac OS have a, are a bit different than the ones which are like a desktop, like Keynote. Like right now I use Keynote and Keynote is very different application behaviors than the menu bar app. So I uh, so, so I put all the code which is related to this package, which is related to my to just my shell in this file. And the final package is the package I just used for distribution. Like I, I have a couple of commands. So if I go to the terminal, I have a couple of commands to, to help me work with the app. I have yarn build, which, which gets the app, builds it, and it creates uh, a DMG file for Mac OS that would help you like distribute the application. And this, it and, and its own package JSON file has all the stuff needed for packaging, but that's not stuff I actually need for the other places. Also, Another thing I, I, I very quickly learned is, um, so in the Mac OS, you can actually see the contents of any, if, of, of any projects. Like for example, if I go to applications and I go to Slack app, I can actually show the package contents of Slack. And I can actually see what their code is like. 
Like you can basically see what fonts they use, what extensions they use, and a lot of stuff because Slack is written in Electron. So you can do this for my app. So if you go here, you can see the contents of my app. So you have this framework thing, and that's the whole Electron. That's basically Electron. And, if, and you notice that this is 163 megabytes. And that's something you cannot escape. Like if you make an Electron application that's always going to be at least 163 megabytes, there is a couple of ways that you can optimize that by cutting browser features. But that's like the basic ones. Like if that's like because uh, that's basically Chrome with all the Electron packaging around it. Then you have the Mac OS executable. That's actually what runs the app. And the resources is the stuff which is like basically your app. And if you notice, all my node modules are actually packed with my application because they're needed to run the application. And those node modules which are here are only the node modules which I need for the shell itself. They are not the one. I'm sorry. Could you please zoom in a little? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me see. Okay, do, is this, yep, just a second. Is this a bit better or I should zoom a bit more? Do you actually, do you actually, if I zoom with com control, do you see this in a better zoom? I think it's better. Excuse me, I don't, I didn't hear you very well. Uh, I think it's really better. Okay, let me. Zoom. Wondering how I can zoom this in a better way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so do you. Okay, I would. If, if it's. That's not enough, ping me again. Uh, because I don't see the chat. So notice that this notes modules here is like two megabytes, which is bad, but not that bad. If I go to node modules for my React Create app and I calculate, 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 it's 230 megabytes. Like if I put all my apps in one bundle, it would be like 300, 400 megabytes. And that's one of the reasons I'm actually splitting the application. Like to go to the open source project and let me zoom here. Uh, I have split the application so the way you can build it this actually helps you build your smaller package and it's actually make it easier for you to only include the code you are going to use in the bundle itself making the application a bit smaller because my initial app which is like this single screen app was like five was i think the biggest was like 600 megabytes which was like 600 megabytes of this thing come on and that's one of the reasons why I, the, the application is split in this way. And I find this very useful pattern and I have not seen it used in another places. Like a lot of people try to manually split the packages in another ways, but for me, actually this worked quite well. And if you go to the open source project in GitHub here, I have a couple of bin scripts, basically scripts which help me manage all of that. And I'll show you a bit of them later. Uh, the other thing which I uh, which was useful, initially I was thinking, okay, maybe I should, like the, when building a, a menu bar app, it involves a lot of like m smaller things in the OS. So I use this package from uh, open source package called menu bar which is just it's a very small package and it helps you build basically it gives you interface for building menu bar applications it handles a lot of uh problems you might have with building um applications like for example it helps you handle dark mode with this icon like changing the color of the icon it helps me basically handle a lot of events related to the menu bar app stuff. Uh, it was a very good win. Um, 
The other thing is, I, I, I'm like just running around it, is how uh, I didn't mention how you can actually run the whole application, like run the um, React Create app and you can run, uh, run it in that shell. So this is the code. Like basically, I, there is two modes of the application. One is you give an electron start URI for the index page. Like this index is the index page you're going to load. If you don't have this environment variable, I just open a build index HTML file. So that's basically create create app. In development, I start two processes concurrently. One is the React start, which starts a local server on port 3000. And if you notice the thing I showed you in a bit, this is the application. Like it works in port 300, so you can actually develop it in the browser. But and I pass this URL to electron start command, which starts the whole electron process, and it passes this thing here. And I can actually develop the application, and that's how it works in development mode. In, for the distribution, what I do is I, I use the, the React build command, and the React build command actually creates a, just an HTML file, like the application, like what a React Create app helps you build is you can actually package the whole application of React Create here in this um, in its app folder, in this in this build folder, only like two that two megabytes. And it's still like the same application. It's basically the same code which runs. And what I do is when I build the application for distribution, First, I build the HTML file, then copies it. I copy it to like a distribution folder, and then I package it, and then I create my focused executable. And all of those scripts are, if you want to go into details about them, you can ask more questions, or you can just come and see like in the source code how everything is handled. Like for example, the bin, uh, the React build, it's a very simple command. It just builds the React Create app. React Start is the same. It's just React Start. It's very simple. And I use a, a nifty package called Concurrently. This is like a very nice NPM package, which allows you to run two processes concurrently. So for example, if I go to my terminal here, you would notice that I'm running like those two processes and it handles like what happens if one of them crashes and so on and so forth. So that's how, that's like, that was like the hard thing to figure out because there is like a lot of things, how to write the app in Electron, how to make it big enough. So for the final part of my talk, like for the next part, I'm just going to loop through a couple of, problems which I had some hard time finding solutions and building solutions for them. So the, the first thing is you want to access Electron via React. Like my React shell needs to access Electron. And initially when I was developing the application, I just usually what I do was I just went to the to here write some code and so on and so forth. So the solutions I, I went through is I have this folder in my open source repo, let me show you. So if you go to the app and, if, and we go to the app and we go to the source folder and this is like the directory structure, there's like an utilities folder where I put all the, the stuff I have no idea where else to put. I have this folder Electron and the electron folder here have a shim. Like I create a shim. I create a, a fake electron if it's not available because sometimes I'm running the app via the browser. And I then I, I just export functions. Like I have a central place where I know which is all the electron access patterns my application is going to use. Like if you if I open this index file, this is the only place 
in my whole app where electron object is accessed directly. So I actually know which part of my apps actually requires electron. And actually, this is, I think, very good pattern for other things. Like I treat electron as an external dependency and this external dependency, I lock it. I, I only have one access point to it and it make and I massage it, make it like uh, really nice. Another thing which uh, come quite fast was my application have to open like an external links. Like let me copy the URL, go here, create a bookmark, and yeah, that's it. So if I click Command 4, I have to open this link. But uh, since this is a browser, opening links in browsers opens uh, the opens the page here inside the electron shell. And that's something you don't want to do when somebody can have full access to your file system with JavaScript loading random pages. Uh, like this is kind of like a security hole if your application can open in its shell another HTML file. So there is a, a way to fix that. Like Electron has two events which are, so you can have an event on, on new window and will navigate to check if you actually have received the URL. Like for example, this is just not like my, some local file on my file system. This is like URL, like um, this example com or my GitHub page. And if my, my, my renderer process tries to uh, render to redirect somewhere out, which is a URL. I stop this event. I prevent it, like event prevent default. And there is an electron way to open external URL. So when I open here, I click this button here, it opens the links. So this actually gives you a, a nice protection. Let me actually zoom here. So this actually gives you a nice automatic protection. The other thing I do is in, in, in here, I don't want to depend on that protection, like it's good protection, but I have my own function, which it's called open URI, which gets a URI, checks if it's a link. And I also have two types of links. Like if I, the way I showed, I can actually link to files. So I can, so I can click here and just open this test file. And what I do is I have this open URI function in my electron utility, and it checks if it, this is a file, it opens the file directly, otherwise it opens the external link. And I have, and here is the connection with React. Uh, instead of using DA, DA um, tag, I have my own tag, which is called external link, which just uses this open URI link. Uh, and this worked quite nicely so far. Uh, the other thing which I wanted quite early to have was notice how when I type here, the window resizes. Like initially when I had like a fixed windows window, it was kind of like weird to type and it have to scroll and all of that. So I wanted to implement windows resizing to fit the content of the web page. And that was like a fun teaser. So the way it was done is in the renderer process, like notice that I can hear, if it's like, what I do is there is a new HTML, uh, like it's a JavaScript API called resize observer. Like resize observer is like a new, new, I mean new supported by most browsers nowadays uh, thingy, which, actually tells you when your when a component like an html dom element has changed their size this resize observer triggers an event when you change that size and what i do is i add this observer to the body because it's just an html 
to the core element. So every time the body becomes bigger, what I do is I call the recite observer, I get all the computed styles, and I do some DOM manipulation, and I get what the height of my window is. Then I check what's what's the size of my window of here, and if those two differ, I sent an event to Electron to resize its window. And here I wait, I'm just listening for this resize event and I'm telling the menu bar app main window to set its size. So when I type here, I actually can resize, it actually resizes. And uh, of course I have like a max height, so this cannot get bigger because sometimes I don't want it to be too big. Uh, but this was like a small cool trick to help you actually resize the windows. And this is something funny because I, I haven't, most of my work ever was on desktop, uh, was never on like a desktop application, was either mobile apps or browsers. And I haven't ever thought about like working with the main window. And when you work on the desktop, you notice that window actually is quite an interesting concept. Like another one is window positioning. Like for example, I'm here and maybe like, I don't want this to be here. Or maybe I prefer it to be on this side. But if I close it, like if I quit it, uh, and again, all these processes die. I just resize it because again, I close the, the app window. To click it now, we just have to wait for React to boot up. Cool. You see how the window actually remembered its position. And this is kind of like a tricky thing to do. I'm surprised it's not built to have it outside of the box because I think this is something you might actually want. So I had to write this myself. And again, code is open source. You can go back and see it in details. So the way I, I, I have this is uh, I write the code in the shell part of the application. So by the shell part, I mean, let me go here to the shell. Uh, you go in these utilities and you get to, to this settings module. Like I call this uh, settings where stuff is. So I have two functions here. One is set window bounds. And this is something which, and I use this external library called electron settings. Electron settings library is, allows you to store values in electron uh, in your application. Imagine like a local storage, like um, the, the application for the Chrome window, the, the, the renderer stuff, uh, since it uses Redux, if you see the inspector, like it uses Redux, but I have local storage and on every keystroke, I store all the state in Redux and I keep this in the local storage and this works quite well. But, but the shell process doesn't have access to the local storage. There is a couple of hacks that you can actually access it, but it involves too much. Uh, evolving and I was a bit worried about stuff. So I use this uh, package called electron settings, which uses files in the way you would use local storage on a browser. So what I do here is I have two functions. One is uh, setting the window bounds of the whole of the whole window. And the other one is just observing events on the window, like electronic sending events. Like for example, when I move, when I resize, I'm, I'm tracking all of that. And because I'm resizing the windows, uh, I'm, I'm like recording movements. If you write to a file, every time you do stuff like that, it gets really slow. So you need to debounce it. Like by debounce, what I mean is, you write and you flush to the file system the, that setting when you stop drag, drag. Like, for example, I drag, nothing happens. And now it writes to the file system. So it has this uh, performance considerations here. And since I have the setting module, 
after a window is created, I start tracking it. When my application is ready to deploy, I set it bounds. And this is how the window works there. Um, and talking about the setting module, a lot of the core things are wrap my app is shortcuts. Like I really want to access the, the app like with, I mean, with hands, with no mouse. <laughs> and I wanted, and Electron has this concept of a global shortcut. Like you can register key, key shortcuts which run to, to your whole application. Unfortunately, a lot of apps use global shortcuts. Like my current shortcut is for triggering the application, I usually use CMD plus slash. And turns out people who use VS Code use this symbol a lot. And I have to pick another shortcut. Like there is a really nice website where you can see popular app shortcuts, but that was too much. So I think every user has like a free shortcut. So what I did was I actually implemented, I had to implement like a list of shortcuts, but I, I allowed the global shortcut to be changed. Like I added a setting where I am al allowing the global shortcut to be changed. So this was a bit of a jumping back and forth because uh, I have to set a setting from the, the render process. It has to go and only the main process can actually, the shell process can actually set settings and it actually works with files where it stores that setting. So I have two functions. One is called get the global shortcut key. And this get global shortcut key is just to show it here. So when I change it, for example, to M and it doesn't work because it doesn't accept that because it's already used, I it changes to the correct one. And I have one another one which is updating this shortcut. So this updating of the shortcut does some minor validation and sends event to the renderer process. And the renderer process uses our good friend settings module to uh, basically update the global shortcut key. And this is the code here. It's a bit messy, the way it actually tries to like registering the whole key, this like, and it allows me to basically have a shortcut where I can access the application really quickly. And it's like a toggle one, like if the window is visible, it's shown, if I close it, it's not closed. And this was like a very cool small feature, which involved a lot of like back and forth between the two processes. Uh, another fun one uh, feature I want to talk about is the change log. Like as every good project, you should have like a change log, basically list all the features and all the stuff you're updating. And I'm a big fan of Markdown. So if you go to the application, you can see the change log as a Markdown file. And I didn't want to duplicate that knowledge. So I have, I use these two libraries, which actually this surprised me that works. One is called raw.macro, and the other is uh, basically React Markdown. So this actually allows me, to, this raw thing allowed me to actually load the contents of a file outside of like the change log markdown file, load that content, put it here, and it actually gets the content of that file actually gets compiled into the um, into the build folder. So if we go here in the JavaScript bundle, you can actually find the change log text here, which was a cool small trick. And the final thing I want to leave on, and the final tip I wanted to share, it's not that it's not very positive. Like uh, this is how there is uh, something called like there is two pa two ways for you to build your electron packages. The one I choose because it has like better tutorials. I don't know. Uh, I didn't choose the other just because it looked a bit more weird. Is electron packager? It's a very good packager. Like if you since it doesn't fit on the screen, if you go to the bin and electron package, you can see like, okay, you have settings about your application. Uh, this is a cool thing, setting up languages that your app supports less languages, like electron has 
includes all of them and you don't want that. And it builds DMGs, it's fun, but notice that I have this big comment out about OSX signing and notarialize. And this is something related to like the App Store. And I mean, I, I won't put the app on the App Store, but on macOS, in order for you to run applications, it's good that those applications are signed and notarized by Apple. And in order for you to do that, you need Apple Developer Certificate. And it's technically it's a good thing because it like adds layer of security of macOS. Like right now, everybody can actually use the app, but they get this warning that it might be dangerous. Uh, so I tried to sign up for Apple developer account. I haven't done this in a while. Like I used it for iOS and it was like so long ago that I forgot about it. So the first thing, my first roadblock was this nice message from Apple, which was two-factor authentication. It's like, you currently have two-step verification turn on, but two-factor authentication is required. And I had to talk with their support to actually find out what's the two-step verification and what's two-step authentication. And the verification is basically verifying your phone, email, and authentication is having uh, an extra device where you get these Apple codes, like the two-factor one. <laughs> so it's uh, it was kind of a bad language. The next road black was, okay, you pay $99 for that thing. So, okay, I paid it. And they say, yeah, you, you to take up to two days. And I got so far, I tried this three times. I had two payments rejected. Like I tried two of, I have like two, two, two times and I'm like praying for the third one. Like hopefully that third one, which was a couple of days ago, the bank would approve it and I can actually pay for that. And actually, oops, not that, that will be a bit later. And actually I can distribute the app because the nice thing about Electron is it has like a built-in updater. So, for example, I have an XML file somewhere on the internet on S3, uh, and that XML file actually says which is the latest version. And Electron has this thing built in which to check for version updates and handle the updates for you. Unfortunately, in order for this to work, the application has to be signed or notarized, one of the two. So, before that, I cannot basically release it like a public until this is done. So yeah, that's uh, basically it. That's basically what I wanted to share. And this is like, I basically made a talk which would have been very useful for me like three months ago. So yeah, thank you very much for everybody who is like uh, listening, like the slides are on this address. Um, the, the source is under my GitHub repo. Um, you can find it here. And yeah, uh, it's time for questions. I don't know how many of there are. Let me go to the screen. Thank you, Rado, for this talk. Yeah, I'm watching to the chat. Do we have any questions, guys? Type them in the chat here. Okay, hello, I see hello, hello, hello. Uh, I get the question, could you do this with the shell as well? Uh, what can what can I do with the shell? I, because... Assuming in previous moment. Ah, with, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, any questions? Oh, Rado, could you stop sharing your screen? Oh, okay. Stop. It would be better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Any questions? We can wait a bit. I have one question to you. What most? Uh, what were most challenging to you while developing this app? Of uh, basically not going overboard with features. Like basically, it was a very it, it it was like okay, I have this small thing, 
I don't want to spend a lot of extra time adding a lot of extra base of whistles, which I don't want to have. And the other one is basically learning building a desktop apps. I haven't built one of those. Uh, I have a question. What about Vim? Uh, about this Vim here? Uh, what's the what's the question about Vim? Uh, in particular, why I use Vim? Because it's awesome. Or I can give more more deep answer about Vim if it's interesting. Okay. Ah, why do I use them? Okay. Okay, uh, let me first, before I answer why I use Vim, because that would be like a fun, I would share in the chat the link. Uh, so why use Vim? I use Vim for like the last eight years or 10 years now. Uh, and I use it mostly because it's really fast and it, uh, and it, it can be used fully without needing like a mouse or a trackpad. Like I have a lot of customization on Vim, like Vim is very customizable for my needs. So I actually have a lot of plugins I have for myself. And I basically, all my code is very shortcut driven. Like I basically don't use a trackpad when I work with this, with code. Uh, so that's basically the main reason. Like it's a lot of habit. Like I have looked tools like VS Code, for example, it looks awesome. Unfortunately, I have so much muscle memory that I would need like a month to be as half productive. Also, I have a lot of plugins with Vim, which gives me a lot of like IDE, like Visual Studio Code type of uh, auto completions and stuff like that. And that's the main reason I actually use it. Uh, the, another question I saw, how did you test the app while developing it? So uh, initially, what I was doing was I just opened the localhost 3000 and basically doing like a web app. Afterwards, uh, in the repo, I have a command. I built myself a command, which is called yarn dev, which uh, starts two processes. One is the shell process, and the other is the render reports of the whole application. And while I'm developing, this process just runs. So every time I made a change, the change comes live. So I actually see that. Any other questions? Actually, let me... So actually for testing the app, let me actually share my screen again. Uh, do you see my screen? Mm, I think no. No, I it's not. Oh, that. yep, sorry. Yeah, it asked me for a combination. Okay, now the screen is available, right? Yep. Cool. So, for example, if you see the app here, like you see, oops, uh, that's actually the real app. No, that's okay. So, if you see the app here, I have started this process here. So if I go here and I go to, okay, I'm zooming. So if I go to the app, I have the SRC, I have the screens folder and I have my task screen. This is my task, the main screen of the app. So this is like uh, the whole application. This is like this main screen of the app. It has a sh use shortcut. So basically it does my really nice shortcut management. It actually, this is where I do like the drag and drop files support. Uh, I have the app menu. So here I can just add like a div with some text. I can save it. And you see here it is. Like I didn't need to refresh. It's basically React Create App working. So you basically have everything from React Create App. So if I remove this and I can come here, I can see this working and work nuts. 
Uh, that's the bay, the main way I'm testing the app. It doesn't have much unit tests. Uh, I have it. I, I have it in TypeScript. I have like Redux stuff. I might need some unit to add some unit tests for some for two features I need to add in the future, but I don't have any other tests. Cool. Any other questions? We can wait for a minute for more questions. Cool. Do you plan to start developing another app? Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Do you plan, uh, the question is mine, do you plan uh, to start developing another app? Uh, I have a couple of ideas. I would see what's the current time, especially with the summer productivity drops, but I have a couple of ideas uh, for other apps. And that was actually main idea, main reason I wanted to do, to learn Electron and basically learn how to do a test or a menu bar apps. Is because I'm a big fan of menu bar apps. I have a lot of ideas for menu bar apps on macOS. Like if you see, I actually have a lot of those. Like I actually have an app which collects all the other <laughs> menu bar apps. So definitely have other ideas. We'll see how it's with time and. Cool. We have two more questions, I think. Cool. What are the other questions? Uh, the other question is from uh, Daniel Gossip. What do you plan to add in this app? It looks very promising. So there is like, I, I actually plan to release it, <laughs> to sign it and authorize it if I can finally give Apple money. That's like the first thing I want to do. And there is like, uh, basically I want to do like, um, couple of more like i have basically three features that i would love to do uh one of the features is to have an ability to actually sort tasks based on completions like for example i complete this task i want it to go on the top or the bottom like depending on the settings like i have options for uh sorting the app so that's already here uh another options uh, another thing i'm wanting to do is uh, sometimes I'm trying for Modoro timers and I have like a menu bar app called uh, Focus, uh, which is basically a Pomodoro timer. And Pomodoro timer is you work in 25 minute intervals. So a lot of times I actually might want to add like a small Pomodoro timer here for the application itself. So I'm able to like basically not have an extra app and basically be able to like time my work uh, because I have found that especially in the in the current situations where productivity is not very high, Pomodoro is a really good way to uh, give you support. And the final feature I want to add, like the third one, uh, is right now this app supports only this screen. Like this is, it supports only one task. You can, for example, save these tasks to a JSON file and uh, and have this be here. And the nice thing is, by the way, the app actually have a very good undo history. So you actually have this in the file. But every time I only can have one task at a time. So this would actually erase all my current work. And one big feature, which surprisingly nobody from my bet testers still asked, is for having multiple tasks. So basically you can have more than one task or you don't need to juggle all those json files so those are like the three things i i would most probably want to add like i would definitely want to do the sorting because it's i already have like prototype of it and multiple tasks is a bit more complicated ui wise and that's basically it those are like the three things which i think that make the app complete
and think that you think it's promising. We have another question from Atanas Boskov. It's a bit uh, long. Hey, great talk. Thanks very much for the info. I've tried Electron a couple of times and the IPC bridge always put me off. The hard-coded event identifiers make it really easy for junior developers to make a mess of things when communicating between threads. Is there something you know of that can make it a bit easier and safer to communicate between the main and the render processes? Okay, yeah, that's... I haven't worked with junior people on this with this project, but what I have done in previous pro in other projects, and I think it would help, is having all communication being explicit in, and centralized. Like for example, as I showed, if you go to this utils folder in this electron, uh, all the electron code is actually here. So making the communications. Uh, Bit, it's in uh, let me zoom. It's here. Like every sent event, every uh, basically every sent event is here. You can find it. And this file is starting to get a bit messy. But I can imagine like having like a place where you might have like events. Uh, like you, you might expand this to have to be like something like use electron senders and sorry uh, receivers let's say receivers and and basically say all communication with the render with the main process should be either a sender from here or a receiver from here and you can do the same thing in the shell like uh, you can um uh, oops uh, where did my file go? Yeah, so let's say, oops, uh, this is in the app. This is in the shell. So you can actually just make 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 those explicit, like make all those. Okay, this is all the places in this central place where I I have all my connections. This is how you do it. You never get out of those. You always do use this interface. Uh, also, if you use TypeScript, it's good maybe to name your event as type constants. So you actually have like a list of all the events so they can actually have consistent names. They can be used as constants. And I think this is an, a way for people to actually know what they're doing. Because a lot of problems with junior people and not only with junior people, even with senior people is People, when work, try to, well, oftentimes they would see something similar to what they're trying to achieve, copy, paste, start adjusting stuff. And if you don't have a place to tell them, okay, this is how it's done, for them, it's really hard to make the right decision. Other questions? Yes. Oh, we please. have one more. Do you use the JS to save the notes for the times when you turn off your computer? Uh, so if I turn off my computer, the notes are still there. Like I cannot demo it because if I turn off my computer, my screen share will disappear. But the notes, every every text here is stored. Like here is the application. I just quit it. I quit. And if I, oops, I have to open it from here because that's another app. Uh, so if I open the application again, It's that exception is because it needs for React Create Link to like boot up, boot up. Sorry, yeah. So there is this small bug when you start the process. It has you have to wait to open for the localhost three thousand to start. So if you see the text is here. Like the, the reason I, I have the feature to save files as JSON is I worked on a couple of big tasks I want to focus. Like the whole idea of the app is to focus on a, like a big task, a task which would take you like a day or two or three. And a lot of times I actually work on two or three of those. So surprisingly, 
that's that that's the goal. That's the reason I have save as file. Like, but the app actually stores all the data in local storage. So between removing, like, causing the app, it still stays. Any other questions? Talk share my screen. If you haven't any other questions, we could wish you good night. But if you have, come on, write them. Yeah, you can always ping me on Twitter or any other channel later if you have, or open GitHub pull request with cool features. That's a great idea. Uh, some people asked in the chat, uh, we are going to share the recording in the beginning of the next week and the presentation, I guess, Radu is okay if we share it as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's online. Like, uh, I'm actually going to tweet about, like, I'm actually, let me share in the chat the slides. They're already, like, live. Here they are. I'm sharing them in the chat. And I'm actually going to tweet, tweet about them, like, nothing secret here, hopefully. Great, thank you. So, thank you very much, Rado, for joining us. If uh, you have guys more questions, you can reach out to Rado on Twitter or somewhere else. I'm sure he will answer you. The another third uh, HackConf online meeting is coming up on the beginning of July. We will meet with our speaker from the last year, Majid Hajian, who is going to speak how to get started with water. I hope I pronounce it well. I'm not really, I don't know this uh, technology very well. So we'll see you soon. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.